first question <coughs> that I should ask you to, to, to do is explain to folks mm. what you mean mm. by this. Arguments for a colorblind America. What do you mean when you say that? So a lot of people equate colorblindness to I don't see race mm -hmm. or to pretending not to see race. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake. We all see race, mm -hmm. right? And we're all capable of being racially biased, so we should all be self-aware to that possibility. My argument is not for that. My argument is that we should try our very best to treat people without regard to race, both in our personal lives and our public policy. Of course. And the reason I wrote this book, thank you. you can clap away. The reason I wrote this book is because in the past 10 years, it has be become very popular to, in the name of anti-racism, mm -hmm. teach a kind of philosophy to our children and in general that says your race is everything, right? And I think that is the wrong way to fight racism, and that's why I wrote this book at this time. Can I, I'm sorry, baby. Yeah. Can I just point out that there is a reason for that? You know, when I went to school, getting any information about anyone's race was not taught in <coughs> history. There was no black history. None of those things were taught. And here in America, 100 years ago, when I was a young woman, <laughs> that's how people saw you. That's how they judged you. So I think, I don't want to say it's the, your youth, but I think you have a, a point, but I think you have to also take into consideration what people have lived through in order to understand why there has been such a, a, a pointing of very specific racial things, like women couldn't go to get into colleges. If you are a black person, there are a lot of colleges wouldn't accept you. Trying to equal the playing field, I think that's what a lot of folks were, have been trying to do. I'm sure, sorry, I didn't sure. mean to cut you off. I think that's your experience, and, and that's valid. You know, as a counterpoint, mm -hmm. when I was in fifth grade, we all watched Roots mm -hmm. together yeah. in, in public school. Yeah. So these are different experiences. I, th yes. I think it's also different generations. Mm -hmm. It's different parts of the country, mm -hmm. right? We have very different cultures all living together in one yes. country. So I'm not going to deny that. But I think I view this notion of a colorblind society similar to the idea of a peaceful society, which is to say it's an ideal. It's a North Star. Mm -hmm. And the point is not that we're ever going to get there. We're not going to touch it. But we have to know when we're going forward and when we're going backwards. And we're going backwards when we're doing woke kindergarten in San Francisco uh, you know, with, with, you didn't hear about this story? No, oh, yeah, no but wait. <laughs> wait, wait, because yeah, I yeah. want to get to the part yeah, of the book. Yeah. Okay, you actually you believe that public policies that address socioeconomic differences would be better at benefit, benefiting disadvantaged groups, and that race-based policies often hurt the very people they're trying to help. What are some, some examples of policies that would be better at reducing uh, racial disparities? So my overall argument is that class, socioeconomics, is a better proxy for disadvantage. We all want to help the disadvantage, and the question is, how do we identify them, right? The default right now in a, in, in a lot of areas of policy is to use you know, black and Hispanic identity as a proxy for disadvantage, and my argument is that you actually get a better picture of who needs help by looking at socioeconomics right. and, and income. Mm -hmm. that, that picks out people in a more accurate way. Well, right? so, I just, and, and, not my ahead. question, but yeah. When you say that uh, socioeconomics picks out people in a better way than mm -hmm. race, mm -hmm. when you do look at the socioeconomics, you see the huge disparity between white households and black households. You see the huge disparity between white households and Hispanic households. So your argument, and I've read your book twice because I wanted mm. to give it a chance, mm. um, your argument that race has no place in that equation is really fundamentally flawed in my no, opinion. No, well, there's two separate questions. One is whether each racial group is socioeconomically the same. That, well, the, I agree with you, the, they're the, not. The, yeah, of they're course. not, and the stats the question show is, that. But the, yeah, of course, I agree with that fully. The question is, how do you, how do you address that in the way that actually targets poverty the best? Great. And what Martin Luther King wrote in his book, Why We Can't Wait, mm -hmm. is he called it, we need a bill of rights for the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, we should address racial inequality. Yes, right. we should address the legacy of slavery. But the way to do that is on the basis of class. And that will disproportionately target blacks and Hispanics because they're disproportionately poor but it will be doing so in a way that also helps the white poor, in a way that addresses poverty as the he, thing to be th addressed. That part is true, but <clears throat> as you are a student of Dr. King, I'm not only a student of Dr. King, I know his daughter, Bernice, right? Mm. So I, I'm, I'm gonna get to my question. Go ahead, go right ahead. Um, 
I think the premise is fundamentally flawed. You, you claim that colorblindness was the goal of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. based upon Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, you know, content of character versus the um, color of skin. <laughs> Bernice, Dr. King's daughter, points out that four years after giving that speech, actually, um, Dr. King also said this. A society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for Negroes. He also said in 1968, it was about less than a week before he was assassinated, this country never stops to realize that they owe a people kept in slavery for 244 years. So rather than class, he did write about that earlier on, right before his death, he made the argument for racial equality and racial reparations. And so your argument for colorblindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted. And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Well, so how do you... Who, who, he's who never voted well, you, for a you, 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 you've said that you're a conservative. No, you, you, no. No, you did. You actually said that uh, <coughs> in the podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not a, yes, he's not, yes, you did. So, but my question to you, my question to you is, how do you respond okay. to those critics? Okay, let's let give him okay, so an answer. First thing I want to... I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out about doing something special for the Negro. That's yes. from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that I, that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, yes. and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based po but, policy. But he also says okay. you must include race. <clears throat> no, he didn't, he says it's Yes, a, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go, everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't think I've been co-opted by anyone. I've only voted twice, both for Democrats, mm -hmm. although I'm an independent. I would vote for a Republican, mm -hmm. probably a non-Trump Republican, if they were compelling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any evidence I've been co-opted by anyone, and I think that that's, that's a, an ad hominem tactic people use to not address, really, the important conversations we're having here. And I, I think it's better, and it would be better for everyone if we stuck to the topics rather than but make it about so, me. But with it's no, not about no you, evidence but I, I just I want to give you the opportunity to respond yeah, to the, I, I appreciate your, it. the criticism. I appreciate it. There's no evidence that I've been co-opted by anyone. I have an independent podcast. Mm -hmm. I work for CNN as an analyst. Mm -hmm. I write for the free press. I'm independent in all of these endeavors, and no one is paying me to say what I'm saying. I'm saying it because I feel it. Yes. Alyssa. You have the question. Uh, Coleman, thanks for being here. So in the past decade, it feels like racial tensions have gotten worse. Um, do you see it that way, and what do you attribute it to? Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you look at all the data, it finds that race, race relations were getting better until about 2013. That year, you had a majority of black, Hispanic, and white Americans saying race relations were good. And then you just see it nosedive. And 2013, it, you know, people like to blame, Republicans like to blame Obama. It wasn't his fault. <laughs> Democrats like to blame Trump. It, it was actually just technology. We all got social media and smartphones, and we had videos being promoted in the algorithm that were unrepresentative, and it created this impression that racism was on the rise when, in fact, it had been on the decline for decades. And it Do allowed you attribute everybody. that at all to foreign actors getting involved in technology? Uh, yes, Russia tries to meddle, absolutely, but I, think, I don't think we can blame foreign actors. Mm -hmm. This is a homegrown problem. Okay. I have a question. Because you write that the anti-racism movement, there are a couple of People, I don't even who, know who they are. Maybe you Robin know. D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo, yeah. Ibram Kendi, for instance. Okay. Well, they, uh, you say that that is just a form of, another form of racism, and you even say it has a lot in common with white supremacy. How can you compare those two things? You, I you compare talk about them anti racism, because... you're comparing it to white supremacy. Because they, they both view your race as an extremely significant part of who you are. So, ra white supremacists, they obviously say, we all know what they say, okay? Uh, Neo-racists like Rob D'Angelo, they say that to be white is to be ignorant, for example. Well, wow. this is a racial stereotype, and I want to call a spade a spade and say this is not the style of anti-racism we have to be teaching our kids. We should be teaching them that your race is not a significant feature of you, who you are. Who you are is your character, your value, and your skin color doesn't say anything about that. That's, that's actually misrepresenting so, what, what Robin D'Angelo's yeah. position is. It's in her book. But but a lot, that's a lot of, and a lot so of here we go. Here we go. Thank you, Coleman Hughes, for coming.
because this is a show of lots of different opinions and mm -hmm. we are multi-generational and we all got an opinion. Yeah. So, the end of race politics, arguments for a colorblind America is out now and we're giving it to you all so you can read it and judge for yourself how you feel about what he said.